Yeah, we're really early. You're on. Oh, we're on. You can be here. Uh, I wanted to welcome uh, Tom Malott, uh, our guest lecturer for today. And uh, Tom has uh, been very gracious to be our guest lecturer a couple of times. And uh, students off and on campus liked it a lot. And we invited him again this year. And he graciously agreed in spite of uh, some other things that uh, would have kept him back at his home. And he wanted to fly up here and, and make this presentation live. So thank you, Tom, for coming back here again. Uh, Tom is extremely accomplished in many, many different ways. You'll see that come out uh, during his presentation. And it will be obvious to you as to the depth of uh, experiences he has had at, at uh, organizational level, engineering level, design level. Uh, and and uh, mul multiple uh, roles that he has played uh, in industry. Uh, Tom was the president and CEO of Siemens uh, Energy and Automation, also CEO of Ransburg, uh, VP at, uh, of products, engineered products at Parker Hannifin, and held several board positions. He's an honorary doctorate from Purdue University, and also MBA from uh, Western Michigan University, BSME from Purdue, and several, several uh, accomplishments as well as awards uh, from from uh, both the College of Engineering and the School of Mechanical Engineering here. So he's an alma mater. And I greatly respect Tom for uh, not only his knowledge, but also his deep insights into how things work. And so Tom is going to be uh, talking to you about it. And I wanted to welcome Tom. Thank you again for coming. Thank and you. uh, your Good. microphone you. is here. So let's give Tom a hand. Well, I attended many classes here, and you can tell it's a, a new world from at least the world I grew up in. It's the first class I've ever come to that starts out with music. <laughs> they were, uh, when I was here, they were beating you over the head with slide rules, so that's a long time ago. But uh, today I want to. Uh, try to go through really uh, uh, two points that uh, uh, one I think is a societal point that is really important and I think uh, uh, certainly a number of you in this room uh, if uh, you move forward in your career and focus on innovation can certainly help society and I will uh, speak to that Secondly, uh, I think uh, uh, engineers, and I, I came out of engineering, started to work in engineering, and the uh, primary reason I went into management, I was so frustrated with what appeared to me to be stupid decisions being made by so many people, I figured I could do it as well as anybody else, so I went over and started working in management. Uh, but there's a big, normally a big frustration that people run into when you come from the university and go into an organization and uh, how you uh, feel sometimes that all that you've learned is being uh, some way filtered out by the organization. So I'd like to speak uh, to that and uh, the, the, the essence of it is that you're going to come out of here uh, with a great toolbox of tools, very sharp set of tools. Uh, you can argue over whether this is the best place in the world, but I can tell you that you won't run into many people in your whole career that will be as equipped as well as you are with tools. So the tools are like uh, what's used by a, a good woodworker. You know, you can uh, have somebody, your grandfather, grandmother leave you a real nice set of really sharp and beautiful tools. But if you can't use the tools, uh, you become very frustrated with them and sell them on eBay or something like that and get rid of them. So the essence of, uh, again, what we're going to try to go through today is to show you, at least from my experience, what are some of the real uh, ways that can help you use your intellectual capability through uh, organizational structures. And uh, one fundamental you'll learn about organizational structures 
uh, they're all messed up always. There's always some set of problems with them. There isn't such a thing as a perfect one. But you have to understand the one you're in or you'll get lost in it. Uh, the social side of this is that uh, politicians, uh, particularly uh, in recent years in this country, and for that matter around other parts of the world, have been frustrated because uh, after uh, 08, uh, the growth rates, the economic growth rates have been slowed down. And of course, uh, our politicians are jumping up and down and talking about the American dream like we're the only ones that ever had a dream of uh, people starting down at the lower levels and working up and having a, a, a decent way of life. I mean, the whole world wants that. It's just not the American dream. But the politicians are really uh, spouting about it. Uh, the one, po one thing that I've learned about listening to politicians, uh, if you listen to them carefully, uh, they use very smooth language that basically says nothing. Uh, so you're never going to find a politician that's going to, you'll hear them talk in this country in particular, uh, we're going to make jobs. Well, how do they make jobs? The only way they can make jobs is make another department in the government and hire people and stick them in there. They can't really stimulate economic growth. And so we'll talk a little bit about this. This is not going to be about engineering. It's going to be mostly about, about uh, social sciences and economics. But in any event, uh, what you're going to find and uh, 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 that the world works and almost everything you ever get into works off of very simple common sense things. You've been drilled. Uh, uh, very harshly on how to solve very complex mathematical equations. What you're going to find in life is that that uh, most things, again, you look at and, and see some common value in what you're looking at. You can decide in a moment what needs to be done. So uh, that's really the essence of it. And I think uh, for the, it, this is not only for America, but it certainly applies in any country that is, by its nature, a high cost, so called high cost country. We're always going to have low cost uh, areas in the world, or at least for a long period of time in the future, that can do uh, inexpensive assembly work. But the kind of problem you get yourself into is what we've gotten ourselves into here where we still have a large percentage of people who have the, only have the skills for that kind of work, and it's diminishing. So that's the fundamental economic problem. And the only real solution, there are, th there are three ways to increase economic wealth, and I'll get into that. But it all boils down to, in a modern age, the only way that you'll get growth is through innovation. Now, I know. Everyone in this class is probably not in here just to run out as soon as you get your degree and work on innovation. Some of you are. Some of you want a credit so you can get your master's and get the hell out of here. And uh, so th th what I'm going to be talking to basically are the, and trying to stimulate some thought about how rewarding a career in innovation is and how important innovation is to really our, our society. So uh, with that, uh, I'll get into, and I hope I, I'm used to working off my feet in with, uh, now what happened here? Where's the arrow? What did I do, kill it? There it goes. I need somebody Help. Not just anybody Help. You know, I, I basically someone. covered these Help. points already and I'm not going to spend a lot of time you can read the detail but essentially what's in here is what I've, I've already covered you can see in that second point I and you can probably tell my political bent uh, I compare the our politicians to Nero about standing up and yelling about the, the building burning and not know how to put the fire out. So it gets down again to 
uh, having dug this hole that we're in, how do we get out of it? And uh, I think as we go through this, you'll see, at least in my view, the only real way is through accelerated innovation. And that's essentially what we're going to do here. Uh, Tom Friedman, probably many of you have read the book on the flat world. Uh, I can tell you, you know, when I started out, I grew up in the state of Indiana. Uh, I thought a long trip was to go over the Michigan border uh, and uh, really never had been out of the Midwest. And then I ended up uh, spending from the time I was my late 20s to till, till I retired uh, wandering around the world. So. I can tell you from a practical experience from the, the 60s to now how I've seen this world change. And I couldn't be more uh, aligned with uh, Friedman's uh, view of what it is. And this little slide depicts when I grew up, which was in the, in the 50s, uh, America was considered the best place in the world. Everybody was lined up to buy our products. There was one simple reason for that. First of all, uh, this country uh, uh, was the leader in mass production with Henry Ford and people like Taylor. Uh, we knew how to make things in quantity and scale was driven into your head that you were looking for the next three or four pennies in something over production scale. Second thing that happened is fortunately the Western world uh, won World War II. Uh, the advantage we had for 30 years is that we essentially blew up our competition. So from 45 until 75, we could build any piece of crap and sell it any place in the world because there was nobody else there to build it. So then we woke up, like we are now, with people with better tools, better education, and more focus. And we live in this kind of a world, which is a very, very competitive place with people popping up all over through the internet being able to compete. So the world you're going to live in, in my view, will even move further in this direction of flatness and interlinking. So th that's an extremely important point. Now, this is a slide that simply shows the fact, and this again is common sense, that when you've got uh, uh, wealth in a country, this old saying about wealth or, or a high water floats all boats, that's true. Uh, it's really hard to h help the people lower down in a, in a culture unless there's wealth to be spread. So obviously the countries that have uh, the wealth build up and also the, uh, the moral integrity to try to bring the downtrod up are really hampered unless there's wealth. So there's more to having wealth than what you'd think. And in a simple equation form, the wealth of any nation uh, gets down to uh, the R stands for natural resources. I've got to slide a little further along here. Uh, uh, luck is far better than skill. And if you were lucky enough to be born on a gold mine, your life is pretty easy. So countries that are setting on a lot of natural resources and can use them as a major element in wealth. The other is just physical possessions. And I'll get into how many nations have gotten physical possessions. And finally, and the most important, it's a utilization of the human talent in a, in a, in a country or in a region. That, and the conversion of that into tangible and intangible kinds of of uh, items that come out of good hard work and brain power. And uh, for all the old mechanical engineers, you'll see something similar to F equals MA or E equals IR, depending on which school you've gone to. But essentially, all this is saying, and this is common sense again, that uh, you don't move the position. There's inertia in any kind of a structure. 
you don't move this wealth of a nation without some forces being applied to make that happen. So the question really gets down uh, to uh, what are those forces and, and how do we apply those forces. Uh, now, in terms of, uh, I'd like to describe uh, some of these elements. And we already mentioned the uh, utilization of raw materials. And uh, again, this country has been blessed. Uh, Australia is blessed. Uh, many parts of Europe not blessed with uh, immense uh, uh, raw materials. Uh, same thing is true in Japan. And yet, uh, there's, there's a country that has done very, very well by using someone else's raw materials and adding a lot of value to it. But again, if you're lucky enough, and you never want to discount luck, particularly in golf, is that if you're lucky enough to have it, hey, uh, you've got to step up on other countries that don't. Now here is the way society worked for many, many years and how wealth transferred to many European countries. Uh, these initials in this slide uh, stand for rape, pillage, and burn. Uh, for years, people would run around, and if they had some innovation in their shipping and, uh, and, uh, and the uh, ability to find their way around the earth, which the British clearly had, uh, they built wealth for 300 years out of running around and I always uh, joke with my British friends their, their basic model was to go in with a small military force take over the country take a native uh, promote them to Maharaja or whatever it was and they'd put a financial guy then in from Britain to take the stuff out of the country and build up the wealth in Great Britain so that's the way that all worked uh, that still goes on, unfortunately, in too many parts of the world. And I have a, uh, another uh, element there. You can see uh, RPB2. Our, our, uh, uh, that means that there are modern means of rape, pillaging, and burning. And uh, that is in, is in the form, in my opinion, of many uh, governmental organizations that figure out a way to take stuff away from the value added part of society and put it in their own pocket. So this is still an element that goes on. Fortunately, uh, the type of um, that went on in the uh, uh, dark ages uh, and then on uh, into the 16th, 17th, 1800s has been dissipated. And then finally, innovation. Innovation in my definition, is basically a term that says that, uh, and this is different than, than if you want to call it creativity. Innovation is taking ideas, seeing a need, developing and making a solution for it. And the solution is good enough that you'll have customers willing to pay more for your widget than somebody else's. And we'll get into some more examples, but essentially that's what it amounts to. If you build a better mousetrap, somebody will pay you more for it. If they pay you more for it, if you're managing it well, you'll end up with more money in your pocket. So that, I think you've got to be very careful about the definition, but that's my definition of it. Uh, and therefore, uh, the same equation can be uh, lined up that the real wealth is a combination of luck, uh, what your ancestors were able to steal, and finally, uh, innovation uh, as it applies to uh, the products. And uh, in terms of the value added from the earliest times, economic growth depended on sensing a need uh, filling the need, taking raw material, modifying it one way or another, and finally r recognizing that it's uh, by the set of customers that it is worth more than the next guy's widget. And the extreme of innovation is what I call a game changer. 
Uh, I mean, I can give you all kinds of examples for it. You know them yourself in your own head. Uh, internet is clearly one in our age that basically has changed the world. Uh, these gadgets that all my grandchildren have attached uh, permanently to their hands uh, is another item that's changed the world. Uh, and this curve, since you're all engineers, I thought you'd like at least one curve in here. This shows uh, essentially that the margin generated in, uh, in uh, economic transaction can be plotted something like this. And you can see that uh, at this intersecting point, it actually goes negative if you're looking at the left-hand side of the graph where uh, there are, is no real value added by an organization, it starts losing money or a society starts losing money. As you start adding value, you'll see for some time a kind of a linear relationship. The more value you add, the greater the margin you're going to get. And finally, if you hit the home run and you're out here at the right-hand side, you'll see that the purchases and the commitment to you are driven as much by emotion than by logic. And you can get a lot of money for something. So if you're trying to hit the home run, you want to be out here on the right-hand side of the curve. And the importance of it, I mean, this, again, is pretty much common sense. The, the higher the, the price, obviously, the gross national product of an organization or a country goes up. And what you find in the real world that with focus, it doesn't cost you a hell of a, a lot more money to develop a truly innovative device than it does something that is just mundane. So there's a huge leverage between the cost that you put into doing something if you do it right versus if you only do it in a very weak way. And again, an innovative solution gives you this advantage. Here's just, and, and one could argue with this slide, this slide's about two or three years old now, but uh, an example of two very similar products, uh, one an Apple and one uh, a, a, a Kobe that I suppose one could argue uh, would do the same kinds of things, but um, uh, like uh, a lot of people uh, that, uh, I always kid my, my son about it. He always likes to wear Izod shirts for whatever reason. I go to, to Costco or someplace like that to buy mine. But he pays more because there's some value in his mind. And that's exactly what you've got with an apple at five times the price of a piece of something else. And it is the element of the innovation and the perception of value. It has nothing to do with the logic of it. It has everything to do with the perception of it. So, uh, you know, and Apple's, it, you can still say, you can look at Apple's balance sheet and say it's a pretty good set of numbers that they have there. Uh, when it was up at 700 bucks, uh, they had more cash than many countries. So there's a perfect example of wealth generation off of innovation. And if you go around Cupertino even today, you're not going to find unemployment very high. You're going to find a lot of BMWs and Mercedes running around in the parking lots. So there's a perfect example that the, that, that the wealth kind of floats all the boats. So in the end, what I'm getting at here, and I realize looking around the, the, the room here, you, we've got people from um, probably all over the world setting here. Uh, the focus that I've got is what do you do basically in countries like America, like Germany, uh, like Japan, that also has very high costs now 
of labor and social cost, how do they compete? And so uh, innovation ends up being about the only way left. Uh, so it's obvious and simple. If uh, innovation is the way to the future, then all we have to do is have the politicians tell us innovate, and we should just go out and innovate, right? Well, uh, the problem you get into, and this is the real part of innovation, you've got to go down a path to get to innovation. First is discovery, and uh, all of you around the university understand that, looking for ideas and what have you. Second is that if the uh, discovery is good, uh, people will run around and get some kind of a patent claim on uh, a device. Uh, and believe me, there are a lot of people who in organizations love to get patents. It's like stripes in the army. The more they get, the more they're happy, and so be it. But the real question is, what happens to the patents? And if you take a path and look at these elements, you can see uh, uh, in any organization, uh, getting from discovery to innovation can take multiple paths. What happens, and you may, all may be aware of this, but somewhere between knowledge and discovery and something hitting the light of day, there's a huge filter that takes place. There are more, I would bet you, if somebody had the task in Purdue of going around, getting into old dusty cabinets, you'll find more good ideas floating around here in a cabinet than it would take to run the whole country. And so the real question then organizationally, what, what really has wasted all of this information? Because at least in my mind, uh, and the professors will get mad at this, Knowledge for knowledge's sake is one thing, but if it never sees the light of day, it doesn't impact the world. So getting it from an idea to the world is what's important. And all organizations are faced with what I call the gauntlet. And particularly, I think, for the, I think we've got more people uh, in this class that are, are in organizations and working than we do in this room. And so uh, they're quite familiar with this. And any organization has it. And what it says is that if you have an idea and you have to try to get the people convinced to use it, there's all kinds of social impediment to getting the idea from your head finally out the back door in a product. And what are those? Uh, it's people versus technology to start with. You're going to find in any organization, uh, people in this class, this room, will be up at the top half of 1% of the people in your organization and have deep embedded, embedded technical knowledge. And you'll be talking with lots of people that don't have it. So if you start to talk in what all of us learn in our technical gibberish to somebody who has uh, a, a, a BA in art history in the marketing department, you'll find that that ends up being a big filter. So you've got to be able to think in terms of communicating in terms that the average person can understand. If you're off at a beer joint with three engineers, you can you know, talk about physics or whatever you want to talk about, and everybody will be happy. But in organizations, it's not the case. Humankind, uh, everyone wants to have the best idea. And if you bring in your idea and they have another idea, you'll find all kinds of resistance to yours. It may not be logical, but that's just human nature. Culture, the tribes, and this, again, what you run into, and I will get into this in more detail because I've experienced much in 
my own lifespan is that any organization is a tribe. There are some really good books that talk about tribal structures. This is true when you go to another country. It may not be a tribe, but there's another culture there. And if you don't understand that culture and the value set that that culture has, trying to get your ideas through that and the approach you take, again, can be a gauntlet, can be an absolute gauntlet. And finally, what, and I know many of you are uh, not focused much on the human skill of selling, but I would impress on you as much as I can that whether you like it or not, you're going to have to learn how to sell. Any organization, it's harder to sell stuff inside an organization than it is to a customer. So you've got to understand the elements of how I take my idea and I sell it. And moving through the gauntlet, this is what uh, some of the elements that I found in my lifespan in working through an organization. Uh, honesty, integrity is really the top one. You, you don't want to get caught in an organization telling half-truths and what have you. That'll finally catch up with you. So you've got to build that. You've got to build the talent of listening to other people. And if you've got an idea and they have something to add to it, even if it is some minor hampering to what you're trying to do, think about bringing that into it because you've just bought a partner by getting them engaged with it. Uh, and as this third one is taking complex things and, and breaking them down into simple entities. Uh, this is like a word problem in algebra. Uh, and uh, some people love to make things complicated. Uh, my, I worked many, many years with people from in Germany so Germans, by their nature, are like to, uh, not all Germans, but they certainly like to make things complicated. Uh, if you've been lucky enough to have a Mercedes Benz and you pull out the operator manual, you have to have, you, you know, it, and they assume you're going to take this damn book home and read all of it, right? <laughs> uh, if you look at the instruction book that you get for a guidance system, again, it's this thick. So. This is the ability to, to reduce complex things into the fact that the that average person can under. Argue your, your points directly and say what you mean. A lot of people sit back and they'll see something that appears to be stupid uh, in a conversation. It probably is stupid. And don't be afraid to say in a nice way that maybe that's not correct. So you've got to be forceful and in an ability to see what I always say, see through stupidity and bullshit because you'll, you've got a good logical mind and what you're going to be see as you go into organization is that you can listen to people and know whether they're down a logical path or not. And you have to speak up about that. Initiative and tenacity. Organizations are desperate for people who are willing to, what I always say, pick up the shovel and go do something. You learn in most academic environments, and I'm not throwing a stone at Purdue here, that the purpose of a meeting is to set up the next meeting and go to the next meeting. And organizations are the same. Businesses are the same. So be the person who steps up and says, hey, we've got enough information. We don't need to prove this out to the 14th decimal point. Let's go build something. And so taking decision making will help you get all of your ideas through an organization. In selling, you have to know your customer and, your, and who you're competing against. 
And you've got to visualize that within an organization, if you're in a department doing something for another customer, or for another department, that department's your customer. So you better understand what motivates them and what drives them if you're going to design something for them. So knowing these parts of your organization is very important. I've got it right here. Know your internal customer. Know your culture. And uh, I've got a, uh, a slide a little bit further along here. Uh, and I learned a lot of this the hard way. You, if you're working in another culture, or if you are working in a group that has various cultures in it, try to do some reading in history of those countries and those regions and determine, most importantly, what their value sets are. Because you make decisions around your own value sets. You may not think that you are, but you are. And if your value set differs from theirs, then you've got a problem. And a, a perfect example of that, again, is a, a, all the years I've spent in, in, in Middle Europe. If you're working with people in, in Germany, for example, same is true in Japan, uh, you'll find that uh, they will uh, take a long, long time to make a decision. And the reason for that is if you go and look at their value sets, they don't ever want to be measured as failing. What do we say here? Well, go try and fail. If you fail, you know, pick it up and go do something else. Their failing is a problem. And so you have to learn how to maneuver around those differences in values and be able to put your ideas in a context that fit their value set. And if you don't understand that, again, you want to find a gauntlet. You know, it's like going in, like, like uh, the old wagon people here that went across and wandered into the patch, into a tribe of Apaches and tried to explain why they were on their land. A lot of them didn't have a hell of a lot of luck doing that. So, Having that knowledge, that social knowledge, is extremely important. So I hope what we've learned here today is that the standard of living of individuals is proportional to the wealth of society. That uh, essentially the idea of the, uh, the Middle Ages that if you had a club and a bunch of big guys you got wealthy because you could beat somebody up and take it is gone. So innovation and in building products is really products and solutions is really the way to help everyone. That there are for the wonderful tool set you've got that there'll be all kinds of impediments unless you're willing to take some time and frankly, read into the social sciences and economics and histories of the other parts of the world. Because that you'll find is the biggest gauntlet that you're going to have to run through if you've got ideas and you want to finally see them succeed. And so you, you can argue that... Uh, that uh, uh, if I'm smart enough, people will line up in front of me and take my ideas. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. And I think that ends up being one of the most frustrating things for most young people going in to organizations to, to wrestle with. So uh, you're not going to have any competition from a technical side. The question will be whether you can take your sharp toolbox that you've got and through a social understanding and the understanding of economics, get those ideas into reality in the world. And that's the big challenge that I would, would uh, leave with you. Uh, I put uh, together this list, and I'm sure you've got copies of it, uh, let's see, I get back. 
Well, I didn't have the, uh, see, where is that? It's this one. I would really stress upon you to broaden yourself and study the history and more importantly the values of cultures with which you engage. The more you pick this up, uh, if you get an assignment as a young person to go from here or your home country to another country, before you go, pick up a little history book and read about that country and know what the positives and the negatives are in that country. Uh, know uh, what their holidays are and why they have the holidays. These things will let you integrate with that culture and be able to talk with them. And then I've got some really simple readings. What I really had up here at the top that got cut off, this is a no-cost, simple way to pick up some skills and leadership uh, if you don't want to spend the money for an MBA. And I've tried to condense it into things that I think are pretty important. Uh, there's a professor, or was a professor, he's died now uh, over at Case, uh, well, Case Western Reserve. It was Western Reserve. My opinion, uh, one of the finest researchers and writers in how people get along and how to motivate people. He wrote a very great article that you can pick up on the internet uh, called uh, One More Time, How Do You Motivate Employees? It was in the Harvard Business Review. If you read that and really understand it and look at some of the other references he has in there, you'll go a long, long way to understanding how to motivate your team and work with people. I've mentioned Tom Peters. Uh, if you haven't uh, read this again is an old book, but I think of all the stuff he's ever written the best, and that's In Search of Excellence. If you haven't read that, you can read it in a night or two. It's the best co uh, concentration of how you get to be an excellent organization through your customers that you'll, in my opinion, not that I've ever read. And what it does for you, it'll show you that you can be successful, very successful, in everything from boutiques to building 747s. The principles are the same. And I think he did an excellent job there. Uh, you're probably familiar with uh, the flat world, but damn it, it is a reality. And then if you have time, instead of picking up the next book on engineering, start to do some reading and decision making. Decision making is the key. If you're not able to make decisions and all you want to do is debate, I can tell you your ideas are not going to go far. So that's really important. Strategic thinking. How do I position what I'm doing? Military history and leadership. And uh, a Professor uh, Kardik and I were talking just the other day, uh, yesterday, about this uh, story that I happened to watch uh, this last week on Legos. You want to see an innovative story. It was on Bloomberg. You can pick that up again on your computer. And if you haven't watched it, it's a half an hour. You should see it. And it, it consolidates what innovation is all about and the expansion of innovation in a little set of blocks that you can stick together. It, it, it's fascinating. Uh, take a concentrated course in accounting. If you're in an organization, you have to be able to, and I say only two weeks, because any engineer can learn all they ever need to know about accounting in two weeks. It's not the same for accountants and engineering. And I would recommend a course in finance. Because, like it or not, the world rotates around money and understanding how money and returns are is very, very important. So that's basically my pitch for the day. I hope it's been helpful, and I'm open for questions or rocks or tomatoes, whatever you might have. Thank you, Tom. Uh,
I'll intermix some of the off-campus questions while other people can raise their hands. Um, so Nathan from off-campus asked, um, with many recent technological improvements in manufacturing, reducing the need for laborers, um, some technologies like robotics, 3D printing, uh, in what areas do you see a potential for job growth that can keep the national unemployment rate low? Well, uh, I think, uh, again, we talked about this last night, uh, what's happened in, in this country, it's not necessarily true in Europe. If you look at uh, European countries in particular, uh, in, in Japan, uh, they have an old history of guild crafts. And people who want to buy a fancy watch, you know, I can go get an electronic watch for five bucks, but you've got people standing in line to spend $25,000 to put a Rolex on their watch because there's fine craftsmanship and for many people kind of an ego that's worn on their wrist as well. You can say, I don't have a Rolex, so I can say that, but uh, <laughs> we lost that in this country. And uh, a lot of people in this room could help uh, uh, people who are not uh, inclined to go to a university like this and get uh, intellectual training, but they're good with their hands, to get back into high value craft skills. And engineering can be applied to that. And I, I told him last night, I don't know, uh, you folks don't have much time to watch TV, but, uh, you know, I worked a long time for Siemens, but there's an interesting ad Siemens is running on television now uh, on, on microbreweries. And it's filmed inside a couple of these microbreweries, which is an artisan skill. Instead of paying a buck for a beer, you're willing to stand up and pay four bucks for a beer, or like Starbucks. But this ad is showing, and they're complimenting Siemens for giving them technology that allows them to really precision craft beers. So here's technology aiding a bunch of people who want to just simply make beer. We talked last night about uh, glass blowing and glass making fine objects. So we've got to help and, and not only train our people that aren't able to come to a university like this to get those skills. Uh, they're still there in Germany. If you look at their exports, and I think the same is true in Japan, of uh, very fine, expensive items, that's where most people line up to buy them. They don't buy them from America. They buy them, if you go down through the list, uh, they don't come from here. So if we're in an expensive country, the only way you're going to lift that is to give the people that don't have your skills the ability to compete against those artisans in other high value areas. Another one? Does anybody else have a question? Or should I keep? Oh. So, um I, I have problems with watching lots of various marketing campaigns and there's definitely seems like they try to uh, push push ideas out and kind of mislead lots of viewers of how great some ideas and stuff are and I was curious um, what your stance was on with kind of organizational marketing marketing campaigns and how they try to uh, pinpoint how they try to show truthful, how things are honest, and show your customer the honest value of them buying it. And again, we didn't. I, I, we had some very simple rules. Anyone could come in and complain and bitch about anything as long as they had some suggestions about how to improve it. <laughs> And uh, if you've got marketing people, and a lot of them drift into, again, you can tell my feelings, into politics, where uh, if you've got them in an industrial organization and they want to put out some hoopla, you talk to them and once or twice and then they're gone. Because that bullshit doesn't get you any place. I said that earlier. 
if, if you're engaged in an organization that you've got to survive through bullshit, get out. Leave it. Because they're not all that way. Cool. Okay, so I'll ask another one. Uh, this is from Ann. Uh, in a large corporation, how have you had success in getting a risk adverse upper management to agree to pursue disruptive innovations? Well, I was lucky enough to work for a company where the upper level management wasn't risk averse. And I would say almost the same thing I just said to this gentleman in regard to marketing bullshit. If, if you are a person who really has good ideas and find yourself caught in the gauntlet and that you've got a bunch of people at the top of the company that are reading the, the latest gazette on, on safety and OSHA and all of this stuff, go someplace else because you'll be dissatisfied. If the top, if the top management isn't, in your view, if the top management isn't leading, it's drifting. There's only you only. Uh, it's like an airplane doesn't, or an organization doesn't fly along at a flat level. It's either going up or it's going down, and you can argue over the slope, but that's the reality of it. And so, if there isn't leadership in an organization that wants to innovate and create and build the best damn product or system, then you got to be careful. It's not to say you can't have a good job in a place like that. You can. But if your motivations are different, and you've honestly tried some of these things I've listed here to get through the gauntlet, and you tried three or four times and find out that the the Indians and the gauntlet keep winning, uh, you may maybe ought to consider something else. Not all organizations are good, and you can look around in any industry and see it. It's fun in turnarounds, though, I can tell you that. That's a lot of fun. Again, if you've got leaders that want to turn around, so... Anything else? Yes, sir. How do you deal with decisions that have extremely large uncertainties or potential externalities associated with them? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear. I'm That's okay. Um, how do you deal with decisions that have extremely large uncertainties or externalities potentially associated with them? Well, you know, it, first of all, uh, organizations uh, need to be led in such a way that that uh, uh, combining together with teams and having equal weight in terms of discussion and debate are important. Y you're not going to find too many places today, you know, like Henry Ford that walked out in his garage and started hammering on stuff and he built the business. You're going into an organization where multiple skills are necessary to assess these kinds of issues that you're describing. So if you don't have a team uh, and you're the guy putting the team together that brings different kinds of views together to explore this problem, and they can be people out of engineering. The, the, the worst problem engineers get themselves into is if they get a bunch of engineers together and think they understand the world where they may not. And so, you know, you could get some marketing people. And you can normally do, do that without uh, somebody's permission. You know, you know people in an organization. You go over and say, why don't you come over and sit and listen to this discussion and give, give us your view of it. And so it's a weighted kind of a thing. And I'd also tell you that if you're really interested in innovation, if there isn't a bunch of risk and unknowns to it, it's probably not an innovation. It's some kind of an incremental change. And so that's, that's, that's my view of it. It still gets down to what you sense in an organization. You can sense it at the top of the, top of the organization. 
of what the, the risk uh, tolerance is. Uh, I always, in design, I spent, well, 10 or 12 years in engineering and engineering management before I went on to running businesses. Uh, if you If you've got an organization that's dominated by accounting and financial people, and they're always, I always used to laugh at this, because they would come in and you'd have a project laid up, you know, a design laid out, and, and they'd say, well, what are the sales going to be in five years? Oh, well, you know, we, we'll guess. Of course, the numbers are always wrong, right? And, and you go through the cost and you go through the assumed price and you do a return on assets calculation, return on invested capital calculation, and it comes out to be 18%. And they say, well, our target is 25%. If it's not 25%, we can't do it. And we say, okay, fine, I'll change the numbers <laughs> and we'll get 20 Because you're dealing in unknowns. And anytime you run into a group of people who want to put precision to unknowns, they're lost. <laughs> they're lost. So judgment is a key ability of people. And again, if you're a person who's uh, uh, risk averse, you're a person who will have trouble making a decision. Because if you wait, and this is, a, this is a problem with people trained in technology and where people have beaten you over the head because an answer that you calculated is off two decimal points or some damn thing. The world doesn't work that way. And if you've got, I always said, hey, if we've got 80% of what we need to know to make the decision, we're either going to decide to move ahead or we're going to stop the project. So speed, in fact, I didn't get into that. Speed is maybe the most important economic variable that you can find. If you've got an organization that puts all kinds of, of uh, risk-averse calculations ahead of doing something, you won't be ahead of the race. You're going to be behind the race. So, it, I mean, it's a simple thing to say, but leadership is extremely important. I don't tell people to go get a master's in business administration. I'll underline the word administration. Learn about decision making and leadership. Many countries have gone down the tubes because they have too many administrators. We're fast on that path. When it takes us 10 years to decide to put a pipeline from Canada to the, to the Gulf Coast so that we can effectively produce petrochemicals, and I know some of you will throw rocks at me for saying that, but the point is that somebody else is going to do it, right? In fact, in that particular case, a, a good stock to buy is Canadian Pacific Railway because they're, they're now hauling all of that shale oil off to uh, Vancouver, and the Chinese are out there with their ships taking it right off very nicely. So, and I know, I, I, I shouldn't say I know, I feel strongly that uh, people your age have been inundated probably even in, uh, I know from trying to do projects in this university where, you know, you've got to call 14 people to see whether you can plug a light bulb into the wall. That is not a winning equation. Yes. I don't have this question right now, but like now that in America do you see a lot of company outsourcing their manufacturing plan to developing countries like China, India, Brazil. So 
in most of the time, I know that they still have the corporate in America. The engineering is still in America, and their plan is in some other country. How does that affect the innovation within the organization? Well, you know, first of all, in this flat world idea, uh, we in certain countries in the West have had a, and again, I take the exception of Japan when I'm when I'm commenting on this, have had the uh, egotistical opinion that uh, the only good ideas, you know, come out of the West because we're so smart. Well. Uh, uh, because of some of our immigration rules and the fact that other countries have gotten wealth and built up pretty good uh, higher institutions, uh, people are are studying engineering. I mean, the output in China is about ten times what ours is. You can't assume that those people, simply because they're Chinese, aren't going to start using their heads and inventing and developing things. So this wonderful idea that somehow we're better here is has to be thrown away. And we have to realize we have to compete on innovation. In terms of labor costs, uh, again, what you'll find if you look at the history uh, there's been one low-cost country after another. Uh, Japan was a low-cost country uh, after the war. Germany was a low-cost country. When I first went over to Germany, 25 cents you could get a mark. And uh, it was a low-cost country. But it is now because they built themselves up. And as they build themselves up, they've spread the wealth down through people working, in the, which is good socially very, very good. Uh, as that happens, our difference starts to mitigate. And so that's why you're seeing, for other cost reasons, people coming back here. Still doesn't mean that we've got the skill set that we need, but I don't, I, I think you'll see the, the world shift. There'll be, the, I, I think my prediction is that the new if you will, low-cost labor area will be moving from China, uh, probably into Vietnam or Indonesia, parts of Indonesia. So that, if you will, that low-cost problem will just keep shifting. And as economic value increases in these other countries for the good of the country, they're going to be less competitive. It still means that in a country like this, if we don't, and I use automobiles again, if we can't build something to compete with uh, the German manufacturers in high-priced automobiles as a higher percentage of our output here, uh, then he's not going to be uh, happy. You know, you can't pay somebody 70 bucks an hour, including all their fringes, to screw a fender on a car. That's done. <coughs> it's gone. So we've got to shift screwing fenders on to having that person make something of a higher value that somebody else in the world wants. And that's the game that you folks, I only wish I was your age because I think the opportunity and challenges uh, that you face are, are fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. So, um I, you seem like you've answered some of the uh, smaller questions. Um, one person wrote kind of a paragraph. I'll try to read it quickly. It's worth reading. Uh, <laughs> Justin, um, <clears throat> oftentimes while working in large companies, innovation can seem impossible. With numerous departments and countless integrated process teams following structured, documented processes, having many signature authorities like chief engineers, project managers, etc., engaging in interdisciplinary work environments and operating under strict timelines, it seems so hard to put a ding in the infrastructure process. These large organizations occasionally have worker bees with the mentality of, quote, it's a hairy process, but it's above my pay grade and it currently works, so let's not slow down now. <laughs> We've tried and failed in the past to change it. It's the way we are forced to operate. Let's just keep moving forward, end quote. What are your thoughts on this dogma, and how can the little guy influence change? 
I hate the dogma. <laughs> the uh, the unfortunate, in my opinion, the unfortunate answer to that in again old state organizations that build safety into all these sign-offs. Um, I'll tell you a story about that just in a second. Is that unless you see that as an interesting game for your life that you want to and there's nothing I mean a lot of people want that okay they want the security they want the stamp at the pay grade and they're willing to work their 30 years or whatever it is stay there but if you think as a, 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 a new employee that you're going to change the direction of a large company and its attitude that's, I suppose it happens sometimes, but there, there's not a lot of, of uh, possibility for it. And as I've said several times, you know, if, if you're in a dance you don't like, go to another bar, find another place. Because there are good places. There are really, believe me, really interesting live places that don't uh, plaster over. And all that is, everything he said, is a way to put off making a decision. It's a way to go to the next meeting. And you've got to finally ask yourself, is my end customer willing to pay for all these meetings? Most of them would say, for God's sakes, no. So you've got to think of it in that sense. I wish it was an easier answer, but that's my answer. And as a support to that, uh, when I uh, joined Siemens, Siemens was late coming back to the United States after World War II. We only had, we had less than a billion dollars in revenue. When we left, we had about 20 billion in the States. Uh, we did some of that through internal growth, a lot of it through acquiring. We acquired uh, what was an old famous Milwaukee company, uh, Alice Chalmers. It went way, way back, built electrical stuff, mechanical stuff. And uh, we had several plants and they were very regimented and they were very proud of their quality. They had this huge quality department. You go into any plants, they had plaques up all over and everybody had buttons on and all this stuff. And so I'm looking at the income statements. Well, the income statements were showing that our uh, warranty costs were 8% of sales. And I always said to anyone in any of our businesses, I want that number down to a half a percent or less because at half a percent it becomes noise level. So I started talking with the uh, the guys that were in charge of the uh, the uh, uh, quality. Uh, taught, they went around the plants, caught, caught, uh, taught quality, gave out all these awards. They said, well, what is the difference there? They got all these awards and that plant's got 8% of the stuff coming back in a basket. And they said, well, we, we just go through all the classes. I said, well, why are you awarding somebody that ships out a bunch of junk? So that's a perfect example of what happens in many organizations where a department gets put in to do something. And as long as they're giving out their badges and they've got charts, they're happy. But the customer isn't. So needless to say, that department went away in a relatively short period of time. It happens. Anything else? OK, there's one more person that wrote in. Um, you might have spoken to a little bit about this, but he's interested in groups. So Eric wrote. Um, uh, to be effective in the pursuit of innovation in a large company, how do you believe to be the most effective engineering organizational design in order to support both sustaining and innovation activities? How do you determine the correct number of engineers needed? How do you determine the right mix of background, discipline, and experience level? 
Well, uh, it depends on this, the type of company. What we, what we found is, first of all, uh, small groups are more effective than trying to put it down through some kind of a large engineering structure. So we would set up uh, smaller teams to tackle a project. Uh, one of the mistakes we made, uh, a lot of companies that size will want to build an international product. So we, we started out saying, okay, we'll give, we'll set up a team in, uh, in Sweden. Our organization's in Sweden. And they're assigned to build this next product for the globe. Well, we did this three or four or five times. And then what we found out was that these things coming out of Sweden had for international purposes had horns coming out of their head uh, to match the Swedish culture, and they didn't fit the world. So what we started doing is putting teams together with people from around the world so that the teams were focused with input from the various countries we wanted to serve uh, in the teams. The answer to the engineering question there are a number of engineers, is give me a few bright ones and I don't need any more. Masses of them won't, they'll get in their way. You've got to trust small leadership, small decision making, and making sure that those teams are set up that have input, active input, not, not off someplace else, from marketing and finance coupled with the engineering talent to bring this product forward. And again, if it's internationally focused, we've got to bring people together from around the organization into those. And you let them fly. And sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. And again, if you're checking, if you're praying that notice no errors are ever made in your organization, you'll fail. You'll fail. The safest organization is one where there's no one in it. No one can get hurt. <laughs> If there aren't any more questions, I've got another three hours of lecture. <laughs> Anything? Well, good luck to you all. And uh, I hope at least 10, 15% of you end up as really great innovators. This is a great course that he's developed. And it's abstract. And it is open problem solving. And that's what the world is. You're going to have a very narrow job if you keep waiting for someone to walk in and hand you the problem. Let's thank Tom again.